Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and start. Um, I'm going to stop my share for a moment so we can see everyone's beautiful faces. And um, I'm uh, Sammy Aaron. I know many of you on the call today. And um, all right. Um, so I just want to introduce uh, the Resilient Activist and myself a little bit. Um, the Resilient Activist is a new nonprofit in Kansas City. We're about two and a half years old. And the mission is to build resilience, optimism, and hope in response to the impact of the climate crisis. We support environmental stewards by providing stress relief and nature-connected programming as we meet in community to promote a sustained and adaptive effort that will drive positive ecological change. So I want to welcome uh, all the Extension Master Naturalists that are on the call. Hold on, I got a couple more people to add here. And, um, and others of you that are outside our usual climate conversations, uh, which is one of our uh, regular programs, ongoing programs that we have. Different topics, it's the third Saturday of the month from 10 to 12. And there's always a little bit of education, a little bit of community building, a little bit, uh, typically we'll do a meditation. Uh, today's event's a little bit different because it's a little more formal. I would want to let you know that, um, especially for the master naturalists that are on using this as part of their advanced training hours, you do not need to take copious notes. Uh, the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation itself will be made available to the Master Naturalist for the Speakers Bureau. All the notes, all the words that I say are, are embedded within the PowerPoint. And then also this is being recorded. So any of you who feel like you'd prefer not to have your video displayed, um, feel free to turn your video off. But the video will also become part of the Speakers Bureau and um, Master Naturalists will be able to use that for future presentations to different groups. So um, just so you'll know that that's gonna be available. I'm asking everyone to please keep your sound muted until the very end. Um, Julie Rounds, who is um, one of our Extension Master Naturalists who works at the Pollinator Prairie with a lot of us, has offered to monitor the chat box. So if you have questions or comments that you wanna make during the presentation, go ahead and put them in the chat box and we'll open that up um, for conversation at the end. Um, we do have some other speakers, some other Master Naturals that are on the call today too, that'll be answering questions. Um, just because it's gonna get real boring for you to hear my voice this whole time. But because this is going to be an official recording of this presentation, um, we'd like to go through it without interruption. And then after the fact, um, we can open up and you guys can speak all you want. Um, we will take a short break about halfway through, so you can plan on that. And, um, I just want to, I think, well, what time is it here? Um, we probably have about everybody on the call that's supposed to be here today. So I think we're gonna just go ahead and get started. And um, I'm still, I'm still uh, adding people in, so forgive me. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we'll just get started here. Okay, so we're going to talk today about the gardens at the Pollinator Prairie in Olathe, Kansas. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about the K State Research uh, and Extension Master Naturalist Program, too. So I want to begin by acknowledging that this Zoom meeting, which is hosted in the Kansas City area, is held on the traditional lands of the Osage, Kaw, and Sioux people. The Pollinator Prairie itself is located on the land of the Kickapoo, and we know we have much to learn from our indigenous elders about ways to live in harmony with the natural world. 
Today, we're going to explore the transformation of a toxic waste site into a pollinator prairie. So this site is in an older neighborhood in Olathe. It's not too far from the Santa Fe or 135th Street exit off of I-35. So this is what it looked like. This is what it looks like, well, actually the first year after it was planted. So I am Sammy Aaron. I am a K-State Extension Master Naturalist and I became a Master Naturalist in 2015. This is a citizen science initiative of the K-State Johnson County Extension. So we provide volunteer service for natural resource management, enhancement and conservation. We improve public understanding of natural resource ecology and management. We provide natural resources training at the local level and gather dedicated and informed volunteers to educate the community. And we have developed a K-State Extension Research and Master Naturalist Volunteer Network. So what's the Master Naturalist program about and how does it compare to the Master Gardeners? Well, the Extension Master Gardeners, many of you are familiar with that organization, they focus on home gardens, vegetables, garden tours, really plants for humans. The Extension Master Naturalist focus is on restoration of natural areas, ecological systems, and supporting habitat for wildlife. Um, it's a relatively new program. The first class was trained in 2013. As of June 2020, there are 119 active master naturalists, and the next training will be next spring in 2021. So it costs $120 um, to, to go through the training. You just pay that to one-time fee. With that, you get 40 hours of training, which is fantastic. And um, you, can, you are asked to give back 30 volunteer hours a year and 10 hours, take 10 hours of advanced training. So some of our current projects, we work with most of the county parks in Johnson County and others around the city. We work with Kansas City Wildlands to collect and sort native seeds and for invasive species removal. Um, our bluebird stewards manage and monitor bluebird houses throughout Johnson County, and we maintain a healthy ecosystem at the north end of Shawnee Mission Park as potential habitat for the harmless red-bellied snake, which is a Kansas snake in need of conservation. This is our entryway sign. Today's presentation will have four parts. It's an historical perspective on the site's history as a chemical waste site. We'll give you an understanding of how the pollinator gardens were developed the important impact of this site to pollinators, people, and the environment, and how you can create your own no-dig native garden at home in 10 easy steps. There is more information about this site on the Pollinator Partnership website. This particular image is Dr. Chip Taylor, who's Professor Emeritus at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at KU, and he's the founder of Monarch Watch. Chip and others helped to determine the list of plants that would be of most value for native pollinators and monarch butterflies at the pollinator prairie site. So this video, it's about 10 minutes, is available for a more in-depth explanation of the restoration process and the parties who were involved. And all of the links, any uh, sites that I reference, will be included in a follow-up email that you'll receive um, after today's event. There is another video that's not at all professional that I did, just a guided tour of the gardens. I went out one day in June and just turned my phone on and started walking and talking. Um, that also is available and I'll, we'll send you the link to that. It's up on the YouTube page. So it's just beautiful out there in June and uh, yeah, I think you'll enjoy that. Okay, so let's talk about the site history a little bit. This was a former, chemical recycling facility. The site was owned by a company, Chemical Commodities Inc., we call CCI, and they owned it from the 1950s until it was shut down in 1989. CCI was an authorized site for manufacturing companies to send their chemical waste to be recycled or repurposed. 
This was all before the Environmental Protection Agency was formed in 1970. Instead of doing what they were supposed to do, CCI put fencing up around the property, left the barrels out and exposed to the weather, and you can see some of that in this top picture, and allowed the chemicals to seep into the ground in leaky underground storage tanks. Some of the steps that were taken for the remediation were um, air quality vapor mitigation devices were installed in 40 plus homes. These are similar to radon equipment as a few homes showed elevated levels of various chemicals. Homeowners in the vicinity were given the option to have a device installed even if no chemical concentrations were detected. So the reason that's important is rain seeps into the groundwater and it takes along with it any chemicals that it picks up from the soil. That flows to lower levels through the neighborhood to the west of this property. This site is in the Mill Creek watershed, which empties into the Kansas River, which empties into the Missouri River, and onto the Mississippi River, and then on down to the Gulf of Mexico. So as the groundwater evaporates and flows through the neighborhood, any chemicals like heavy metals and VOCs or volatile organic compounds that are in the groundwater are released through evaporation, and this could impact air quality in the homes. So these pictures here, this is one of the sites before you can see, you know, a big fence that was up. There's homes that were really close, and you'll see that later on a map. Um, this was the beginning of the um, equipment, removing some of the soil. Um, this is the, they were the, there were 15 to 20 foot trenches dug on about an acre of the land and the soil was removed over portions of the property. Um, it was replaced with fresh soil and topped with a soil cap. So this is the soil cap in this far right picture. The soil cap is a combination of things. It's a total of three feet deep. It's layered with 12 inches of gravel, a layer of uh, geotextile fabric, which is what you see here, then 12 inches of compacted soil, and another 12 inches of topsoil. So we can plant wildflowers and shrubs on top of the soil cap because the roots can penetrate the cap without damage, but we cannot plant any trees as deeper, larger, and horizontal roots would damage the cap. The cap has four main purposes. It provides a barrier above potentially impacted soils that were left in place at the site. It reduces surface water infiltration. It maximizes the beneficial reuse of the site. In other words, the ability to turn it back into an open green space. And it minimizes potential exposure to chemical emissions from the impacted soil below the cap. So the geotextile fabric is a strong synthetic fabric usually used in civil engineering and construction projects such as highway or dam building that stabilizes loose soil and prevents erosion. So there are some newer versions of this that allow planting of trees. There's one called alternative earthen final covers and it's a pretty interesting um, process. So it's a form of chemical recycling. We, it was part of the Environmental Protection Agen Agency's Region 7 Superfund site. Um, it was closed in, by the EPA in 1989 because of the ground and soil con uh, con contamination. The goals of the restoration were to eliminate exposure and remediate the source area, develop positive community relations, and do a site restoration with the green space and pollinator habitat. So some of the partners, uh, we have the Environmental Protection Agency, Region 7. Um, Boeing's involved. There was a company, Rocket Dime, was an aerospace business that shipped some of their waste chemicals to CCI. They were briefly part of the Boeing company. Boeing took the lead and still works with the EPA on behalf of the responsible parties to clean up and maintain the safety of the site. Haley and Aldrich is an con environmental consulting firm here in Overland Park. They were hired by Boeing to manage the restoration and long-term maintenance and are still involved today. And then we have volunteers throughout the community, um, as well as a relationship with Monarch Watch, Pollinator Partnership, and the Wildlife Habitat Council. 
So the land ownership is a very interesting topic. Uh, chemical commodities is defunct, and yet they're still shown as the owner on the Johnson County property tax rolls. Uh, Keeler Street, Street Open Space LLC owns the property um, where some of the homes were removed along Keeler and Cedar Streets, and I'll, you'll see that map in a minute. The city of Olathe is responsible for about an acre on the south end of the property. BNSF Railroad owns the, some of the property on the east side. And this area is still zoned as R1 single family, although the use designation is recreation. So it should never be allowed to be built for residential back on that site. So what's a super fun site? Um, the remedial monitoring and financial support began in 1989, and that is um, coordinated by the Environmental Protection Agency. So a Superfund site, Congress established the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, also known as CERCLA, C-E-R-C-L-A, in 1980. CERCLA is informally called Superfund. It allows EPA to clean up contaminated sites. It also forces the parties responsible for the contamination to either perform the cleanups or reimburse the government for EPA-led cleanup work. When there's no viable responsible party, Superfund gives EPA the funds and authority to clean up contaminated sites. In relation to rocket dying, so certain wastes are regulated by the EPA and they have to follow a chain of custody protocol for disposal. So this means the company that originally produced the waste maintains responsibility for its proper disposal throughout the lifetime of the waste. So even if a company disposes of it properly, they remain liable for any future improper handling of the materials as happened in this instance at the Pollinator Prairie site. Uh, there was a Citizens Advisory Committee that was uh, made up from a number of people in the neighborhood who were interested. That organization was very loosely held and is no longer in existence. Um, some other uh, organizations involved, the Olathe Planning Department, Parks and Rec Department, and their Neighborhood Assessment Coordinator. And the EPA, along with the other responsible parties, will be involved for decades in long-term monitoring grounds maintenance and financial support. So here's the process. This is April of 2011. The property, this is the railroad tracks going here. This is Keeler, Keeler Street, and this is Cedar. This is Blake coming in. Santa Fe is about down here. It's about three or four blocks north of this site. So 135th Street in Olathe. I-35 would be about right here, so real close there. Um, Blake dead ends at a circle drive, and you can see these houses here. These were the houses that Keeler Street um, LLC brought, bought out in order to um, be demolished and make remediation easier and expand this green space. The rest of this area had buildings from chemical commodities and they've been removed. So this was the very beginning of the restoration. In June here you can see everything was removed, even to uh, all the houses are gone. A few of these trees were left, um, a few of them have survived, uh, not all of them, but um, anyway so this is the beginning of the remediation. By August of 2011, the monitoring, monitoring systems were in place. The soil had been removed and replaced. You can see the soil cap there. Um, and then in early 2012, the restored site was just getting started. So this is, again, this is the circle at the dead end, south end of Lake Street. This is a, a paved walkway that's in. You can see these four leaf-shaped areas are the edging of the new gardens, the pollinator gardens, and we have one, two, three, four, there's another area over here of native prairie garden uh, grassy strips. So this is kind of what it looked like in 2012. And just a quick review of the timeline. Um, 
chemical commodities owned it from 1951 to 89. The site cleanup and remediation took from 89 to 2011. 2012, it was returned to the community of Olathe and the Pollinator Gardens were installed. Um, from 2012 to 2017, the gardens were managed by a number of amazing volunteers who put in a whole lot of time and effort. Um, ongoing monitoring continued at that point, so even after the restoration, and it'll be performed as part of the long range super fund management. In 2017, the management of the gardens were taken over by the K-State Johnson County Extension Master Naturalist, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. So here's the entryway. I'm going to choke up. Because it's such a beautiful site, and you can see there's still homes right there. This um, cornerstone says, return to the community of Olathe in 2012. So we have pollinator gardens and grass beds. So those um, areas that you were able to see on that map, there was a lot of decision making to figure out what goes in each of those beds. So there's a specific bed earmarked for monarch butterflies, another one for bees, native bees, another one for birds, and another one for butterflies. And one of the decisions was, do we sow seeds or plants? Seeds obviously would have been a lot less expensive but a lot uh, more difficult to establish. So they decided to go with plants in most of the areas, although I think the grass beds were um, seeded. The native versus non-native species, and uh, that was a decision some of the people involved early on did introduce some non-native species. We, Master Naturals, have removed some of them, um, but um, that's, a, that's another whole discussion. We were looking for, when the gardens were designed, full season of bloom from early March all the way through late October. So that was an interesting process to be able to come up with plants that meet all those needs. In addition, um, full sun, or at least the ability to have full sun was important. Since we can't put trees in that site, this is gonna be a very sunny, dry site. And then the other thing they looked at was installing as many host plants as they could. So a host plant is a plant that, from a butterfly's perspective, um, its eggs can be laid on just a certain host plant and then the, the caterpillars hatch and they will only eat the leaves of a certain host plant. So most of us are familiar of that with monarch butterflies, right, that they need milkweed plants. Their caterpillars will only eat the leaves of the milkweed. Well, this is one, because we're so focused, many of us, on the monarchs. Uh, this is another one. This is the uh, wild indigo dusky wing butterfly, and its host plant is this Baptisia alba, also known as the white wild indigo. This is the only plant in that family that this butterfly can lay its eggs on. If we don't have false indigo, we won't have those butterflies. In addition, the roots of many of these native plants are up to 15 feet deep. Um, each of the four leaf-shaped garden beds measures 30 by 60 feet, and then those grassy strips are 90 by 15 feet. So it's pretty big, it's a big area. So we're all familiar with pollinators such as bees, butterflies, moths, dragonflies, flies, and beetles, but we don't often think of bats and hummingbirds as pollinators. The only hummingbird in Kansas is the ruby-throated hummingbird, and you can see that there. Um, but as master naturalists, we're providing habitat for other pollinators too, like this beautiful bat, and not just for insects. So each of the garden has a unique interpretive sign. This is the one in the monarch garden. Lots of great information. There is a QR code at the bottom of each of the signs that will take you to that original, the pollinator website, the one with the, the video with Chip Taylor, and then um, where you can get more information. Each of the plants originally was labeled with a sign. Uh, we've had a little interesting time trying to keep those signs matched up with the plants and keep the plants in the place where the signs were. So that's been interesting. Uh, but we're working on some solutions to that. Uh, at the Pollinator Partnership, that was the website that wasn't coming to me, um, the website includes downloadable plant lists for each of the gardens as well as the prairie grasses, so you can get a sense of what was planted there originally. 
So here's the rest of the story. This was planting day. So this was that original picture. Everything had been cleaned up, the sidewalk installed, the garden beds laid out. This many people came to plant. It was, I wasn't involved, but I've just heard some amazing things about it. Um, you might notice this was right when little bitty plants were planted. This is one of the garden beds. There's a red mulch that we use there. And the red mulch is for us to encourage visitors to stay on the paths, but also to step into and experience the gardens close up. So we really want people to, um, to get in close and walk inside the gardens. Oh, here we go. Um, these are some other pictures from the original planning day. Here's a butterfly that someone, a couple little critters that people found as they were planning. This is about uh, blooms from about the first year. So one of the things to note here is the Wildlife Habitat Council's Corporate Lands for Learning certification, which the gardens received in 2013. And there have been lots of other gardens, or lots of other certifications that, uh, that the site has. The site is gold certified within the Wildlife Habitat Council Conservation Certification Program. Gold is the highest level of certification. Um, and it's a program specifically designed to recognize meaningful wildlife habitat management and conservation education program on corporate lands. WHC certified programs are in 47 U.S. states and 28 countries worldwide. There's many different ways to show conservation progress and obtain certification. Specifically, the pollinator prairie meets the certification standards through maintaining the native landscaped habitat, focusing on the food, shelter, and reproduction needs of pollinators, providing educational program and community awareness through partnership with the Extension Master Naturalist, and by hosting our two annual community events. We're registered under the Monarch Way Station, as a Monarch Way Station under Monarch Watch. The creation and maintenance of Monarch Way Stations contributes to monarch conservation and helps assure the continuation of the monarch migration in North America. Way Stations provide milkweeds, nectar plants, and shelter for monarchs throughout their annual cycle of reproduction and migration. And these can be created in home gardens, at schools, businesses, parks, zoos, nature centers, along roadside, roadsides, like any unused plots of land. And it can be as simple as adding milkweeds and nectar sources to existing gardens or maintaining natural habitats with milk, milkweeds. So no efforts too small to have a positive impact. In 2014, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had, had been petitioned to protect the monarch butterfly under the Endangered Species Act. Based on information in that petition, it was determined that federally protecting the monarch may be warranted. The assessment is still ongoing, but with a listing decision to be determined as of December 2020. The gardens are a certified wildlife habitat under the National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife Federation movement. And the requirements there are food, water, cover, places to raise their young, and sustainable practices. So you might want to think about the fact that private properties make up approximately one-third of the urban landscape, and these properties can connect corridors of habitat that are necessary for migratory species and to support the healthy migratory and resident species. Creating a wildlife garden reverses some of the human-caused habitat destruction that's harming wildlife. And it's easier than you think to create your own wildlife garden. So there's some, you'll have some links to sites that can help you do that. So the site recap, as of 2012, the area is a total of 3.46 acres. About an acre of it was uh, the remediation site and converted to gardens. There's four garden beds, um, the bird, bee, butterfly, and monarch. There are the five prairie grass beds. Uh, there's water access at each bed, so there's a, a hookup for a hose so we can water. Uh, their public benches were installed along the sidewalk area. A tool shed was installed, all the signage, um, and the two public events. So let's talk about those a little bit. 
our two main events, which we've had a little difficulty with doing this year. We're, we still don't know about the Hasta Luego Monarchs, if we'll be able to host it. But typically the Wonders of Discovery event is held in June and it focuses on all pollinators. So it's attended by Johnson County summer camp participants. We've had up to 400 kids arrive by bus, plus hundreds of visitors from the general public. We have booths on display, including native versus honeybees, chemical-free gardening, habitat gardening, making native bee houses. And then the Hasta Luego Monarchs event comes during the Monarchs September migration. And there we focus more on butterflies rather than bees or other pollinators. We have stories and artwork about the monarch migration. Um, so they're great events, open to the public at no cost. So here's what some of those events look like. And we have tents all along the sidewalk. We've had up to 20 different uh, presenters and different organizations, including the EPA, the Olathe Library, Johnson County Environmental Monarch Watch brings their caterpillar petting zoo. Operation Wildlife comes with their birds of prey. The Northeast Kansas beekeepers uh, provide some really interesting information about uh, beekeeping and bees, uh, honeybees. We have multiple extension master naturalist booths with information about all aspects of gardening for nature. Uh, there's face painting, music, food, dance, artwork, crafts, and games. So great events, and we're hoping we'll be able to do our Austin Wega Monarchs in September this year. So January 2017, the master naturalists step in. Um, the Pollinator Prairie is an official project of the EMN, Extension Master Naturalist Program. Volunteer work hours at that site count towards our annual requirement to maintain our certification. The mission of the Pollinator Prairie Gardens is to grow and maintain native plant communities to provide habitat for native pollinators and other wildlife and create a living laboratory to educate and inspire the inclusion of native plants into home garden areas. So these gardens are designed to help people just like you visualize how you could provide habitat like this in your own yard or in a corporate setting. Our role at the Master Naturalist's role at the Pollinator Prairie is, um, we partner with Haley and Aldrich. They manage the actual events, um, including getting the tents, the food, the signage, the toilets, some of the activities, and then the Master Naturalists provide content in the multiple booths. So we couldn't do it without Haley and Aldrich's um, amazing support. Um, we do maintain the garden beds along with Haley and Aldrich's input. So if we have questions about the soil cap or where we can plant new plants or shrubs, they're the first people that we contact before we make any decisions about that. Um, the Master Naturalists are creating a long-term site plan, which includes additional garden areas with different natives. I personally am holding out to install a pawpaw patch somewhere. Um, maybe adding more walkways, benches, you know, it's, it's all kind of a, a, an interesting path as to what we're going to end up doing in the long term. Um, we develop partnerships with organizations, some we've already mentioned, and help uh, maintain all those certifications with the organizations that are certifying us right now. We are broadening educational opportunities and events. We've been offering um, private garden tours for different groups. We've had partnerships and work days with Olathe Public Schools, especially their Green Tech Academy, um, and various speaking engagements. And currently, we're in development of a comprehensive field guide to be published as a historical documentation of the site. So the, en the enhancements since the Master Naturalist have stepped in, we have created a new entryway garden with host plants, shrubs, and vines along the, uh, the entryway. It looked pretty um, sparse, let's just use that word, before we got that entryway, and now it's very welcoming. Um, we have added, uh, or we didn't add, but um, part of the restoration added a covered pavilion and more benches underneath the pavilion. Um, we've installed a new and longer and taller garden sheds so that people can actually stand up inside of it. 
Uh, we've removed some invasive honeysuckle at the south end in a wooded area. We've, um, we've placed bluebird houses that the extension master naturalists monitor. We maintain burning rotation in the grass beds um, in order to keep out tree species and, um, and other weed species. We've put in the butterfly puddlers, which is really cool, keeps water going all the time. And uh, we buy, revised some of our planting beds. This was um, enabled from a grant from the Missouri Prairie Foundation. We found that some of the original plants just really took over. So when these plants grow out in nature, uh, they might be surrounded, one plant might be surrounded by a hundred other varieties keeping the, the roots pretty compacted. But when these individual native plants are planted in really nice garden soil and they have all this room, they, they say to themselves, whoa, I could just take over and that's what they did. So some of our uh, pathways have been encroached, so we're trying some different uh, methods of Keeping the pathways clean, we've installed a different, different kinds of plants around the actual pathways within the garden. So, um, been very interesting. We have created our first brochure. So now we can actually promote the pollinator prairie and what we do. Um, we have a new website. So on the, rather than the original um, pollinator partnership website, we have one on the Extension Master Naturalist website that includes information on ecosystem benefits um, and uh, the site history, what our role as master naturalists. We have a Facebook page, look for us at Pollinator Prairie Olathe, Kansas. Um, we have enhanced some educational opportunities with the tour groups. We do seed gathering days. Um, so if you want to start your own garden, there's an opportunity for you to gather some seeds and take them home. Um, and we have other work days for uh, volunteers to come in. We have our speakers bureau now, and this uh, presentation will be part of that, and our site brochure. Future plans, um, we want to do inventories of pollinators. We really want to see what impact we're having. We have not done any studies on the counts and who's coming flying in, utilizing which plants and so on. Um, we're enhancing our signage and we want to do some native restoration in that wooded area where we remove the honeysuckle and then of course the field guide that will be an important um, uh, addition to what we have to offer. So just some pictures here, some of our past events. This is Betsy Beatrice presenting. She is the uh, ultimate butterfly expert in Kansas City area and uh, has published one of the most uh, referenced books on butterflies in the Kansas City region. And she's an extension master naturalist part of our group. Um, this is the prairie bed burn. We burn two patches in the spring and two in the fall. We remove weeds and woody species. There's research being done to analyze the pros or cons of burning in the fall or the winter or the spring. And so we're trying to do our own um, experience of that. You can see here how close the property is to the BNSF railroads also. We, this is a garden club tour that we did. Um, we're speaking to school groups and others. You can contact the EMN Speakers Bureau through Extension Office for more information. Uh, we have some amazing artists in our community who created this really delightful a picture uh, where kids can come during our event, put their little face in and get their picture taken. They look like they're a monarch butterfly. I think Nancy Chapman painted that, one of our master naturalists. So this is what monarch tagging looks like. It's so cool. Um, you can get more information about this on Monarch Watch's Tagging Monarchs program. But the unique number, so this tag has a unique number here and a website. It indicates the place and date of release. So before we put these tags on the butterflies themselves and then release the butterflies, that tag has been registered with that number to say that um, this particular butterfly was released at the pollinator prairie on this date. And then if someone finds that, they can take that tag, if someone finds the butterfly or the tag, they can go to that website, report its location and see where it was originally released 
and where the tag was found. So this helps with the statistical tracking of monarch populations, as well as an understanding of their overwintering sites. So visitors are encouraged to step in the gardens. You can see Dave Shackelford there, one of our EMNs, uh, explaining, pointing something to some little kid there. So these are some great events. We also have uh, events that we table at, various public events, including the annual Healthy Yards Expo. Um, our display booths include Bringing Nature Home, which is this one, Chemical Free Gardening, Pollinators and Pollination, which is this one. We have one for inviting birds to your yard, native bees versus honeybees, making native bee houses, and polluters to pollinators, which is a site history of the pollinator prairie. So how is the pollinator prairie funded? Well, the Superfund manages all the expenses related to monitoring water quality and general maintenance of the site. So master naturalists don't have anything to do with that. Uh, donations to the K-State Extension Foundation can be earmarked for the Pollinator Prairie. We have received some grants. I've mentioned the Missouri Prairie Foundation, and we have received other grants from the K-State Extension Education Foundation. Uh, we have had a couple native plant sales where the growers donate a portion of the proceeds to us. Uh, deep gratitude for those. And we've had a lot of in-kind donations. Um, construction materials for that new shed and for native bee houses. Um, I think a lot of that are honeydews for many, some of our uh, spouses and uh, some of the other more talented, shall we say, uh, master naturalists who know what to do with like, I don't know, some kind of saw. Um, we have uh, volunteers that create the content of the trifold displays, our handout materials, the website design and content, and we've had some corporate work days where companies just come out on mass one day. We have a project for them. Um, it's a great way to make a difference. So we're going to talk about creating your own native garden at home. So talking about creating your own native garden at home, this is the sweetest garden I ever installed. It was a free, um, garden from given away by bridging the gap a few years back and so i just want to tell you what's in here a little bit this is butterfly milkweed down here surrounded by slender mountain mint that's this little white bloom really smells delicious this is common milkweed these taller ones with the big leaves not yet in bloom this is coreopsis that yes kind of took over the garden we found that at the pollinator prairie um, there's some echinacea hiding in the back, not really in bloom yet. This garden flocks over here and the aroma is just amazing. Back here is rigid goldenrod. It won't bloom until late September or October. It's just bright yellow, really gorgeous. And then this is a New England aster that will be a delightful purple, a really pretty bush that again will bloom in September, October. So a native garden is important for all these things you see on the, on the little slide here, but it's also important for things like if you like bird watching. So birds, even those birds that are seed eating as adults, they feed thousands of caterpillars to their fledglings. Caterpillars need their specific host plants. Adult pollinators, meaning the mothers of those caterpillars and the fathers, need habitat for their own overwintering and nesting. The plants that these pollinators need, the plants need clean water and healthy soil, and the plants need the pollinators so they can reproduce and create more plants. Plants and trees give off life-giving oxygen and they filter carbon from the air. Our mowed lawns provide habitat for very few living beings, especially when they've been treated with insecticides and other chemicals. So let's talk about how you can create a really simple garden. So you start off by looking at your footprint when you start planning your garden. You assess your property, determine the best site, and you take a look at how sunny it is, how much water it retains, um, how dry or, or moist the soil is, 
all of the things you would normally do with any other kind of garden, right? But another thing that you add is, what was here before this neighborhood construction? Well, probably trees, understory, water retention of, so when there would be a heavy rainfall, all of the habitat that was there would retain that water, right? In this particular image, the water flow in a rainstorm is diverted off to the outside of the neighborhood. So all of the rain, wherever the water flows through, this is Woodland Road and it heads downhill basically from here. There's a little creek that runs alongside. The Mill Creek Streamway is right off on the, uh, the east side or right side of this picture. Any chemicals that are coming off the rooftops, that are coming off the streets and the parking lots I mean, and their driveways, and chemicals that have been put on the lawns, all of that runs off into the stormwater system, okay? So how can you keep a garden, create a garden that will help keep the water on your property so it can seep more slowly into the groundwater system and can also be filtered out? So you start off taking a look at what plants you're going to choose to install. This image shows the root depths of common plants in our home gardens and shows the difference in the native plants as far as the root depth. So these plants are spirea, the roots are about two and a half feet, um, Stella Dior daylilies about a foot and a half, two feet, uh, perennial fountain grass goes down a little deeper, about three, and here's your fescue, or three to four inches of root space compared to native plants. So we have buffalo grass goes down about uh, eight feet. Here we have a uh, prairie drop seed, black-eyed Susan. Those are at about six or seven feet. And this is a common nine bark, which is a beautiful, beautiful shrub. And um, its roots can go down 14, 15 feet. So deep roots prevent erosion retain more water, require less water, so you don't have to water them once they're established, improve soil quality, and provide habitat for ground nesting insects. Natives also provide host plant choices and overwintering cover for other native wildlife, not just pollinators. This is rain garden and buffer gardens. These are great to put around any area where water is rushing through. This is a rain garden. The water will be retained for I don't know, two or three days, not any more than that, and will gradually seep down. Both of these two gardens have streamways behind them, so these are part of the neighborhood streamway system, and these buffer spaces help re reduce water flow and um, require the water to sit there for a day or two and filter down rather than just rushing out into the streamway system. Our native gardens are adapted to our weather patterns. So they understand these plants know how to be wet in the spring, dry and hot in the summer. And we don't have to spend an inordinate amount of times watering and providing fertilizer to make those plants grow. In addition, most natives are perennial, which preserves soil quality because there's no digging, seldom needs watering after the first year and can save time and money for the homeowner. So as you think about what plants you're going to install, be sure to include trees and shrubs. So for example, a native oak tree can support 543 species of butterflies, moths, and skippers. This is really important. And here's a really important thing. This particular tree is located, this oak tree, near the Puffet's corner of the parking lot at the Olathe Community Center on Ridgeview. You try, you go park by the trash bins and it's right across the sidewalk there. If you go from the edge of a branch, which you can't even see here, and walk across through the center to the edge of another branch, it's over 90 feet wide. This is a glorious, glorious oak tree. So here's how you can create your own 10-step no-dig native garden. Step one, select a sunny location. This is a front yard, full sun, right? Nothing else there but grass. Mow the lawn to its lowest setting. Cover the area with layers of newspaper or uh, paper bags can work, cardboard can work. 
Step three, mound up garden soil. You don't have to go get really fancy, expensive topsoil. In fact, the native plants don't really like that uh, because then they'll really grow really tall. What you really want is deep root growth. So you just mound up your soil there to whatever height. So you're making a berm in your yard. The next step is to lay out your plants, put the taller ones in the center and the, the, small, the shorter ones around the outside. Go ahead and put the plants in the ground and then add shredded leaves or mulch. We really recommend shredded leaves are better. If you're gonna do mulch, think about it only for a year or two. So if you think about a little ground nesting bee, little tiny bee nesting under the ground, it cannot wind its way through three inches of heavy wood mulch, right? So a lighter mulch and especially shredded leaf mulch can be a real benefit. Um, one thing to note here, this garden is mostly native plants, but there are a few non-natives for more long blooming nectar production. So these two are catmints. Um, it's a little more formal. We wanted a more formal look in a front yard just to keep the neighbors a little happier with it. So. Step seven, you tuck the outside edges of the paper under, cover with mulch, or you could do a decorative border of bricks or stones. Add some artwork. This one has some great geckos in it. Water it in well. You wanna keep the garden moist the first year, and after that, you really only need to water maybe in August or so. Now, just so you'll know, if these are perennial natives, for the most part, even if you don't water, they'll die back. You might not see them in August, but they're just fine under the soil and they'll be back next year. But if you want the garden to look a little more front of the house looking, go ahead and water it every once in a while. Uh, step 10, clean up in March. We recommend that if you feel comfortable doing it, it's best to leave the dead stalks standing until next spring, as there may be some overwintering native bees inside the dead stalks. So I'm gonna show you that on the next slide. There are some native bees, mason bees and leaf cutters, that make a hole along a dead stalk. So like this plant right here, when it dies, that'll be a little kind of woody stalk that may be hollow in the center or have a pithy center. Bees will make a hole along the stalk, deposit an egg, along with a dollop of nectar and pollen, close up the hole in some way with maybe chewed plant material or mud, and then that egg will develop over the winter and emerge in the spring. So uh, another recommendation that we make is to leave as many leaves on the ground until spring for those insects that overwinter in the leaf litter, like the fairy-like luna moth. So if you can just rake your leaves around the trees or around a fence line or someplace where they can just sit over the winter, then in March or early April, you can uh, run over them with a lawnmower a couple times and make that great leaf mulch that you can use as mulch to cover your garden and keep the moisture in. So this is an example of a leaf cutter bee. These are little red bud seedlings. There's a little red bud tree in the yard and the red bud seedlings are usually, or the leaves are usually heart-shaped, right? Well, someone has cut out these circles and it's probably this critter carrying a rolled up piece of leaf circle. And what the bees, what a leaf cutter bee will do is take that, uh, lay an egg, the female will lay an egg on the leaf, add a dollop of nectar and pollen, and then wrap it up like a little burrito and shove it into the ho a hollow tube. So um, anyway, it's just pretty cool. Here's your new garden. Even a small garden is gonna make a big difference. I want you to notice this sign in the front yard, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We encourage you to focus on host plants for caterpillars, and you'll see this is a source from Lenora Larson. She is the butterfly, butterfly lady that we all go to for advice. A lot of these are not native plants, so partly because it's easy for us to grow things like parsley, dill, and fennel mustards and kale and cabbages. A lot of these are host plants for different pollinators. You can use them to supplement the number of native host plants, or maybe you live someplace where you don't have an outdoor area, you just have a patio and you can grow a lot of these in pots. 
A lot of the annual and perennial herbs can be grown in pots and are just beautiful. And if you follow deeprootskc.org, they had a whole series of free webinars over the last six months on gardening. And one is container gardening with native plants. So they're still up on their website. You might wanna go check them out. This is talking about the sign that was in that yard. A lot of organizations have signs that you can get. Usually the purchase of the sign helps support that organization financially. Installing a sign gives you the opportunity to educate your neighbors about what you're doing and why. You can explain why your yard may not look like the usual suburban yard, what pollinators you're trying to attract, and you can even offer to help them get started, share your plants that are ready to be divided. Pollinator pathways, meaning habitat that's in one yard to the next, to the next, to the next, these pathways are vital to increase the populations of insects and birds. So how do you fund your native garden? There are some ways. Many of the public works departments in their stormwater management departments have money available. In Johnson County, there's a program called Contain the Rain. And uh, you basically go on that site, you find your city in Johnson County, Kansas, click on that, it goes straight to your water or um, stormwater management department that will tell how the funding comes through. And um, most of the cities have funds up to, the reimburse up to $1,000 for installing a garden. It would be like half the cost. If you live in Lenexa, they've upped it. So they'll reimburse up to $1,500. It's a really cool program for gardens, for rain gardens, and for rain barrels. According to Deep Roots KC in the Missouri side, they don't know of any funding programs for um, homeowners, just for larger acreage. And they highly encourage people to contact their elected officials and request that funding be put in place on the Missouri side. There are county and federal cost share programs, as I mentioned. There's a million pollinators programs, has some funds. There's giveaways all the time through groups like Monarch Watch. You can go seed collecting. So you wanna be sure that you are in an approved site, you're with an approved organization and you're not taking seeds from restoration areas. So for example, the Pollinator Prairie is not an official restoration area. And so as we do our seed gathering, we love to give away those seeds to people. Um, there's seed savers exchange programs here in Kansas City that meets a couple times a year. And you can also get free seeds from the National Pollinator Garden Network and the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. You just wanna be sure you're getting seeds for where you live, that they're local native seeds. You can dig up plants in exchange for volunteer work in some native sites. Again, you need permission and you need to be with the approved source to do that. Uh, and then the last is, of course, ask your friends because all of us have way too many native plants and we'd love to give them away to people. So, what's the most important item in your native garden? None of you is gonna have the answer to this, I'll bet. It's a chair and a hammock because when you create an area in your garden where you feel safe and comfortable, and you literally make the time to go sit there, take a nap, read. It's an opportunity to clear your mind and let go of tension. Three deep breaths in nature will replenish your heart and uplift your mood. Hundreds of studies have shown these benefits and more. Speedy recovery from surgery with people who have a view of nature rather than a view of a brick wall. Time spent in nature improves your creativity and memory and it reduces anxiety and depression. So make it happen. It's a really important aspect to what you're doing. Gardening should not be a job. It should be a welcome respite at your home. So how do you know when a monarch's been to your milkweed plants? Well, the first thing is someone's eating your leaves. Like that's really important. I'll tell a story of a friend of mine, a master gardener, who put in some milkweed plants in her front yard, was really excited. She had 17 monarch caterpillars on them, told all her neighbors how excited she was. And she went shopping one day and came back and one of her neighbors saw all these bugs eating the leaves of her milkweed plants that were supposed to be for the monarchs. And her neighbor 
out of the goodness of her heart, stomped all of them because she didn't understand the point of the milkweed plants. The point of the host plant is for food for some critter or some pollinator. So make sure you understand that. Milkweed or the monarch eggs, when they're laid, they're usually laid on the underside of a leaf. So you have to lift the leaf up on your milkweed plant. Uh, the egg, when it's first laid, is about the size of the tip of a pencil. When they hatch, they're little teeny tiny and they get bigger, so they'll end up, you know, about so yay big. You can tell you have a chrysalis, a monarch chrysalis. There's little golden dots on this green chrysalis. So. The other thing is, if you plant it, they will come. It's something to think about. If you create habitat, you're going to have uh, critters come to live in it. It's really important that you plant your garden so you feel safe to allow nature to move in. So create mowed areas around the garden for a buffer area. Know that you can set up places that um, critters don't care. They don't like to maybe go over rocks. A lot of people's first reaction to wildlife in their yard, especially snakes and mosquitoes, is to kill them, right? So I invite you to do research on snake identification, learn ways like this little milk steak is totally harmless and really sweet. Um, learn ways to eliminate mosquito habitat by removing standing water rather than having the whole yard sprayed. Because you have to remember that pesticides that kill mosquitoes also, any insects that are in your yard are also going to receive those insecticides, even if it doesn't kill them, it's still coating on their bodies. So birds that eat insects, which they do, birds eat caterpillars and feed them to their young, they ingest the harmful pesticides that these other insects have been coated with. In addition, the big majority of snakes in Kansas, almost all of them are harmless and they're just simply part of the ecosystem. So for example, if you want to keep down a population of voles or moles in your yard, black king snake might just be a solution. So what can you do? Plant natives to replace lawn and pollinator desert. So pollinator desert is where there is nothing of any benefit and that includes a lot of the hybridized plants that are grown without pollen and without nectar. Practice chemical-free gardening and lawn care. Buy plants from companies that are chemical-free and especially watch out for the use of a pesticide called neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids can be injected into the seeds of plants and remain systemic in the plant for months or years. There's a good resource on the Monarch Joint Venture on what you can do if you bought neonicotinoid treated plants, how you can avoid them, how you can cover them and prevent insects from landing on them for a number of years until that, uh, that chemical has found its way actually out of the plant. You can take classes, read books, listen to podcasts, volunteer at local parks and restoration sites. There's a lot of opportunities. Get on your homes association board and restore natives in your common areas. Attend your local Healthy Yards Expo and Deep Roots KC will have their Planet Native Conference this September. It'll all be online. You will learn more than you ever imagined. Even if you think you know a lot, you're gonna learn a lot. Um, educate your family, your neighbors, your community groups and employers about native plants and why they're important. Create a green team at work. I just want to point out this insect here is a large milkweed bug. So when you plant a milkweed plant, you're not planting that just for the monarch butterfly because other insects rely on that plant also. This milkweed bug eats the seeds in the seed pods of the plants and their role is to keep the milkweed population under control. So if you've ever had uh, milkweeds, especially common milkweeds, take over an area, it's because you don't have a large enough population of milkweed bugs to eat those seeds. They don't harm the plant itself, they're not going to have any impact on the caterpillars, and they're all part of the same ecosystem. So these are some local resources, Kansas Native Plant Society, Deep Roots, uh, Monarch Watch, which is located in Lawrence, and Grow Native on the Missouri side, 
A lot of our native plant growers are certified through Grow Native, and you can look for those tags inside the plants. You'll know they've been grown without chemicals, and they're locally grown with local native plants. So, Extension Master Naturalists are making a big difference. These were statistics as of the end of 2019. We had 93 members, so as of June, we had, that was up to 119. During 2019, our volunteers, our master naturalists, made contact with over 8,700 people in some educational capacity. And if you calculate the dollars to that, we have given back over $140,000 in time, energy, effort, and education. Uh, we've offered 6,500 volunteer hours, and we've received over 1,000 advanced training hours. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I invite you to become part of the Extension Master Naturalist Program in your area. There is one on the, Mass, on the Missouri side. And know that you can make a, a huge difference for ecosystems and wildlife. So I am finished. And I'm going to stop the share. And I'm going to invite, before we get into Q&A or items in the chat, I want to invite Connie Chapman to unmute herself. Connie is the coordinator of the Pollinator Prairie right now and manages all those different aspects that we've talked about. So Connie, I'll let you unmute yourself and um, take it away. Hi, good morning. And I want to thank Sammy for doing such a tremendous job explaining the history of this site. Uh, it is a very remarkable site. It's, it's not huge, and we have a lot of work to do, but there's so much potential for the future in not only developing what I think we're going to, what we plan to call a native plant and uh, native plant uh, botanical garden, as well as a garden that promotes our pollinators and our wildlife. So we're moving forward to try to expand our ideas on this and keep and learn as much as we can and share everything we learn with the public so that they can take these ideas home and start expanding our natural spaces so these animals have a way to survive. So that's, that's our goal and we're hoping that this presentation inspires you as well so we can keep moving forward to help our native wildlife in the Kansas City region. Thanks so much, Connie. I really appreciate it. Um, so Julie Rounds, is there, do we have anything in the chat box that uh, we have questions or comments? Um, so far, we only have two questions. Um, the first one was from um, Toby Holloway about uh, people that, organizations or companies that did um, native land um, landscape, native garden landscaping and um, there was a couple suggestions, one for Courtney Masterson with Native Lands and then also Down to Earth Services. Do you have any others that you might want to add to that? Um, the Crow Native site has um, a resources guide that lists everyone in any aspect of the uh, native plant restoration uh, community. And it's um, located, it's up on their website and you just kind of put in your area and it'll show people that grow, uh, that do uh, provide seeds, people that provide plants, people that do landscape design and landscape architecture design, people that do maintenance and installation, kind of every aspect of it. So it's a really, really great resource and that's grownative.org. Um, a couple other locals that we know and love, Patty Ragsdale is, she's on the call here today and I may switch to her in a minute. She has Happy Apples Farm in Tonganoxie and she's a native plant grower. Um, Jay Parsons is in Olathe, he has Parsons Gardens and he's been involved with some of our um, events that we've had and uh, had done some native plant sales for us. So um, Patty, I'm gonna invite you to unmute yourself, Patty Ragsdale, and say whatever you'd like to say. Are you there? I'm here. 
Hi, everybody. Good morning. And Sammy, that will, that's an awesome presentation. I just love this. Cool. Um, thank you for putting it together for us. I enjoy so much volunteering at the Pollinator Prairie. And I think I would invite everybody on this um, webinar to you know, just take a walk through the place. It's an incredible habitat for pollinators and you will just see that everywhere you look there's activity and during those um, events that we have there the most fun thing for somebody like me is to take a child through those gardens and and, and maybe even a child that's 50 years old like me you know <laughs> these everybody has something to see there and it's it, it having a child um learn not to be afraid of these bees that are everywhere is kind of just really gratifying to interest them um, in what those insects are doing on all of those flowers. And then, you know, I'm a flower addict. I, I just love to have as many flowers as possible around me. And so for even um, adults going through there to see how beautiful some of our native plants are and the interesting um, variety of bloom, time, and color that you could include in a native garden or just at any home garden um, is really, there's just so much to learn from walking through those gardens at different times of the year. So I would just encourage everybody to just take, take a visit um, any time of the year you'll see that the master naturalists are, are working really hard to make the pathways walkable because sometimes um, these native plants get a little bit tall and, can, and our winds can knock things over in rain. So we work on making sure that's a very uh, accessible space for everybody to get close to the plants and the pollinators that are there. So, um, it's, uh, there are two gardens, as Sammy mentioned, that we are uh, actually have done some renovation um, with funding from the Missouri Prairie Foundation um, to kind of put shorter plants next to the pathways to make that maintenance a little bit easier. And we, are, we just planted those last fall. So you'll see if you go there that everything still looks very small on those um, areas next to the pathways. Um, and it'll take a, probably another year at least before that starts to resemble what we were um, hoping to see there. So anyway, if you wanted to see something in progress, uh, the Monarch Garden and the Butterfly Garden are the two that have, um, are experiencing those renovations. That's great, Patty. Thank you. And thank you. I mean, the hours that she puts in is just astronomical, she and, and Connie and a lot of people on the team. I wanted to just mention, I did not mention that the gardens are open every day. There's no gate or anything, like it's just completely open to the public. Thank you, Patty. I really appreciate it. Can okay. I add one thing? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the master naturalists are generally out there on Mondays, and sometimes it's in the morning, and sometimes it's in the afternoon. This year it's been kind of different uh, with the pandemic thing. But um, we really do love to see people um, out there and uh, interact with the public. So anytime, you know, I don't, I don't really know, Connie's the coordinator, so she could probably tell you, but we, we try to practice social distancing as, as well as we can, and we're outside. But um, on Mondays, in, and we have kind of a strange schedules, but mornings and afternoons throughout the month, uh, you might find a master naturalist working in the garden. And um, if you had any questions, we could personally answer them. Great. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Julie, what else have you got? So I'm going to get back to um, Brian Patrick's question just in a second, because I think it's going to take a longer answer. Robert Burns wanted to know if there's, do you know of any other super fun sites in our area? that we need to be aware of? So Mary Ruth Gruis is also on the call. Mary Ruth is one of our master naturalists. She was an employee at Haley and Aldrich, the environmental consulting firm during the time of the cleanup and is now part of 
has her own firm, but is now part of uh, the Pollinator Prairie Committee also as a master naturalist. So Mary Ruth, do you have any uh, information about other Superfund sites? And I assume, Robert, I know you're a beekeeper that you're interested in where there have been some pollinator habitat restored. Um, so in terms of other Superfund sites, no matter where you live, um, what part of the city, if you're on the Missouri side, Kent side, or if you're in an outer area, probably the best way for you to kind of check to see if there's an area around you that's a super fun site. If you're just wanting to have the knowledge of what kind of sites are around you, um, you can just go on to you know Google, do a, a search for uh, like like for instance, I just did one real quick, US EPA super fun site list. And when you go to the website, there's actually a, a link on US EPA's website that says Superfund National Priorities List Where You Live Map. So you can click on that, kind of enter, you know, where you're where you physically are, and you can see what might be around you. In terms of, I'm not sure if the question is just that, wanting to know about other sites that have had contamination, or if it's sites where there's been restoration. Done. Um, I personally am not as familiar with maybe other areas where you know other um, restorations have been done. Um, I work on another site, Wichita, so that's a little bit further from here. But you know, another site. But there, that's another thing too. If you're looking at any of the sites, whether it be where are there monarch way stations, where are there garden for wildlife certifications, where are there uh, wildlife habitat council certification. Any of those websites have similar functions where you can go on, like for instance, on the Monarch Watch website under their Monarch Way Station program, you can click and you'll see where there are Monarch Way Stations registered. Same with the Garden for Wildlife, same for Wildlife Habitat Restoration, or, or excuse me, Wildlife Habitat Council. So those are great resources if you're wanting to see where else or we'll get some of that information on doing any of this uh, certification for yourself. Um, so hopefully that briefest of answers was if you want to find the super fun sites, it's easiest to go look at just a EP website. <laughs> Thanks, Mary Ruth. That's really helpful. Um, another person on the call who might have some information about that, Anne Melia was involved in one of some of the earliest evaluations on the site through another environmental consulting firm, and she and I have connected recently. Um, and do you know of any other sites locally or um, uh, within, you know, distance of the Kansas City area that have had pollinator habitat restored? I, I don't. I'm not sure about the sunflower site out in the DeSoto area, but um, I actually did um, one of the first investigations or was part of that as a field chemist out at the chemical commodity site. Um, we did a soil gas survey in January. It was one of the coldest days I'd ever been working, like below zero. But um, at the time I was out there, they'd already cleaned up all of the drums. So I didn't get to see that, but um, we knew it was a pretty nasty site. So it's very exciting for me. And this was 1990, I think, that I was out there. So it's exciting for me to see um, it come full circle. So. It's a really great presentation and I've enjoyed seeing something. It takes a long time um, when you think about, you know, 30 years, but it's pretty exciting to see it, it actually come to fruition to be cleaned up and onto something that everybody can enjoy. Yeah. Well, thanks, Anne. Thanks for your participate, for your, your little narrow piece of participation in that. It's, it's cool stuff. So, Robert, I hope that answered your question. Um, Julie, what else have you got? So Brian Patrick asks, uh, he is, um, I don't know if this is good or bad, but the city's doing some curb improvements at his house and they um, took out a large chunk of his native garden, but they turned it leaving a horrible rock clay on top and he can't even get a shovel into it. And he's just wondering if you have any suggestions or can think of somebody on the call that might have a suggestion. So that's probably Joe Patrick, is that you Joe? Um, she comes, Joe comes out and does our, uh, from the Northeast Kansas beekeepers. Um, I don't know if you're talking about um, getting the city to do the right thing and put soil in, is that what, is that kind of your question? And, and feel free to unmute yourself if you want to 
ask your question a little more clearly. Uh, thank you, Sammy. Um, it's, it's a large patch. They brought in a small backhoe. So uh, to move utilities back away from the curb and, uh, you know, renting a backhoe is not an option for me so that I can correct the situation. Uh, it's just barren. What city are you in? Olathe. In Olathe. I would contact Olathe Parks and Rec. We have worked with them at the Pollinator Prairie, like when we've done some cleanup days and removing uh, honeysuckle and other invasives. They've we've partnered with them and they've come and picked it up and removed we removed it for us. Um, you may get someone who's who cares, you know, especially because you've put in uh, the native gardens. The other would be um, Rob Bifus. It's like B-I-E-L-F-U-S-S -S at the um, uh, uh, Water what's it, uh, Public Works Department. And he's the one who approves funding for homeowners to put in native gardens. And he comes out and does analysis and, you know, approves the site. And um, so I would contact him and just tell him what happened and say, we, I had a native garden out there and here's what happened and just talk to him. And I, if you can't find him, contact me and I'll, I'll send you his information. Oh, what was his name again? Rob. Rob Bifus, and it's like B as in boy, I-E-L, there's a silent L in it, F-U-S-S. -S. I assume he's still in that position, but it's Public Works in Olathe. Oh, okay, thank you. If I might add, Joe Patrick doesn't live too far away from the, the uh, garden you've been talking about all afternoon, morning. Cool, that is true, I drop in frequently. Oh, cool. That's great, Joe. That way I know what's blooming. <laughs> Good for you. All right, Julie, what else you got? Um, actually, there was another question about um, if you had to be a Johnson County resident to be part of the extension um, program or the Master Naturalist program. And Nancy Chapman did a great job of answering that. Um, Jessica, if you didn't see, you do not have to be a Johnson County resident. You just have to be a Kansas resident. Um, and they are looking to expand and of course everything is slightly on hold this year. Um, Great. Nancy, thank you for responding to that. Nancy Chapman was one of the very earliest volunteers at the site as a master, kind of her through her connections as a master gardener and was really actively involved in maintenance for those years when it was a volunteer project before the master naturalists um, stepped in and were just ever so grateful her the that entryway garden if you go if you walk into it and you enter off of the circle and Blake uh, that design was Nancy Chapman's design and it's glorious so thank you Nancy all right Julie what else um, and I just want everybody if you uh, especially Robert um, and just um, put a link up on the chat box about super fun sites that you can go and look at and I don't think we have, the only other question we have is, um, and I'm sorry, I can't, who was it? Um, somebody, uh, oh, she was not able to be here for the first half and wants to be able to know if it's gonna be available later online. And I know you covered that at the first, but maybe you could go back over that again. Yeah, so this is being recorded and uh, the Resilient Activist has our own YouTube channel. So once the file is rendered, um, and it'll, it'll take me a couple days to do it, it'll be up on that channel. And I will send an email out to everyone who's registered. So I have everyone's email addresses um, with a link to that YouTube video as well as then on the YouTube page and in the email will be a list of all the references, all the websites and everything that was referenced throughout the presentation. So you'll have all that information available. And then that information, the presentation, as well as the video and the links will then become a uh, part of the Speakers Bureau for the Extension Master Naturalists so that other naturalists who are familiar with the Pollinator Prairie could 
either show this video and then have conversation or they could use the PowerPoint and do their own presentations after the fact. What else, Julie, do you have anything else there? I'm uh, trying to read, Nancy wrote something. Uh, so Brian, look at the message from um, Nancy Chapman about the, the rain garden money. Um, one day Reen, um did remind everybody that we have a nice Facebook page, Pollinator Prairie Dash Aletha, Kansas. And if you follow that page, you can get updates like when we get the final details of the um, Australega monarchs in September, those will be posted as an event on that Facebook page. So if you follow the Facebook page, then you can get notification of things like that. So, um, and then Nancy had a great um, information, more information here about um, environmental codes and all that. And I think that is it. Did I, I don't think I missed any other questions. Let me just scroll right back up. No, I think that was it. Lots of great um, kudos to you in the chat box. Well, this has been a labor of love, I'll tell you that much. And uh, it's delightful to get it in a format that I think can be useful and used by a lot of people. So um, what I'd like to do is just open this up to anybody who has a comment. I'm going to shift back to, it'll let me, um, where I can see everybody but you're welcome to raise your hand or just unmute yourself as if anyone has anything that they'd like to say or ask or offer. Um, and I do want to thank Dayreen Street. So Dayreen uh, is managing the Facebook page and she's just going over every couple of days and posting the most glorious pictures of whatever's in bloom and whoever's landing on what plants. And uh, so it's really fantastic. Thank you, Dayreen. Our typical climate conversations, we have a little bit of mindfulness practice. And what I'd like to do, if those of you who are on the call are interested, we have about 15 minutes left, is to just come into a little bit of thoughtfulness. So really all this is, is a way of quieting the mind a little bit and uh, reflecting on what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've thought about, and just being able to embody it and maybe make some decisions about how you might want to um, make some changes in how you garden or who you volunteer with or when you volunteer and, um, and that kind of thing. So I invite you to set down whatever you might be holding. Get yourself in a position wherever you're seated so that your feet are really flat on the ground. You feel really solid and weighted through your hips and your glutes and your thighs. You might even jiggle out a little through the shoulders and the neck. Let's do just a little wrist circles, opening and flexing the fingers. And then the same thing with the toes, just maybe flex the toes, open and release, uh, point and flex through the ankles and the lower legs and just jiggle out. So we're just kind of getting out of our heads. We've been in this intellectual, logical process, right, for the last hour and 45 minutes. So let's just kind of come into more of a quiet space. And I invite you, you're welcome to close down your eyes or just lower your gaze down towards the floor. Let your hands be very solid and stable on your lap or on the arms of your chair. <sighs> Take a deep breath up completely and then exhale completely and feel that sense of groundedness, that connection into gravity. With your next inhalation, visualize the sensation of the air itself, the temperature, the humidity, the moisture. And as you release that breath, visualize sending your breath on the breeze flowing through the most beautiful pollinator garden. Can you imagine as you inhale, you could draw in the scent of each of the blossoms. You can draw in the warmth of the sun, the sensation of the season. With each exhalation, you imagine that you are in that garden 
and you are grounding as if you are putting your own deep roots down. With each exhalation, flowing that sensation of your connection through the soles of the feet, down into the earth. Strong, long, deep roots. There's a sensation that you can connect to the topsoil, to the darker soil beneath. There's a sense of solidity and stability, weightedness and heaviness through the connection to the earth. You notice you could release tension through the low belly and around the waist. You could soften and relax around the hips and the tailbone and the glutes. There's a heaviness through the thighs and the knees as you let your legs and your feet just give way, surrender to gravity. For the next breath or two, you just notice how that feels. There's no sense of having to be somewhere, run somewhere, jump off into the next activity. You're just here in this moment, imagining that sensation of connecting to the ground, visualizing yourself even in a most, the most beautiful prairie. And how would that feel to just be there in that moment? You imagine in this visualization that your eyes could look around at the ground around you. What are the colors that you see? What are the shapes and forms, the plants, the grasses? As you gradually move your gaze up an inch or so at a time, you begin to reach the blossoms on some of the plants and you notice the critters there and who's flying around, who's collecting pollen and who's sipping nectar. What's the sound of their wings as they buzz past your ears? You begin to notice the blossoms themselves, the unique shapes and forms, the symmetrical designs and the repeating patterns in so many of our native plants. And there's a sense as you inhale and exhale that you just sway on the breeze with the stalks of the plants as you receive the breath, and as you release the breath. This awareness of life and all that it gives through our water, our air, our soil, our food. Imagine yourself in this sensation, this setting in your own yard or in a place that you love to be. And visualize a spot that you can create where you have that chair or that hammock so that you can intentionally bring yourself into this space as often as possible. You imagine yourself seated there or lying down and being in that moment and notice the expression on your face. Notice how your breath feels as you inhale the sense around you. And as you take one full inhalation and a full exhalation, you visualize who you will share these sensations with, who will you invite to join you in your garden? 
Who will you invite to share your garden with? And then take a full inhalation and a full exhalation. And as you're ready, you'll gently open your eyes and come back to our Zoom call, come back into your room. And I just invite you to jot some notes. What called to you? What would you like to do? What just made you smile? What plant really just caught your attention and you want to have more of those at your house? Or how did you imagine you might want to make your garden really welcoming and comfortable for yourself and your family? So I think we're finished. Unless anyone has anything else they'd like to offer, you're welcome to unmute yourself. I'm very grateful for all of you to be here. Hope to see some of you as master naturalists, current or future. And we'll be in touch. So watch for your email in the next couple of days for all the details and the copies of the, the links to the videos and all the information, okay? Thanks, you guys. Thanks for everyone who helped contribute also. Deeply grateful. Bye-bye.